Good morning, and welcome to today's evidence-based health policy project capital briefing titled The Other Half of Health, an Introduction to Social Determinants. I'm Sam Austin. I'm the EBHPP project director. Thanks to all of you for joining us for the first in a six-part series of programs that will dive uh, into the social determinants of health that we'll hold over the next uh, two years. As you can tell, uh, there's large interest in diving deeper in the, into these issues, and I'm really excited to have our two speakers today, Lonnie Berger, who's the director of Lee W. Madison's Institute for Research on Poverty, and Gina Green-Harris, who's the director of the Center for Community Engagement and Health Partnerships with EW School of Medicine and Public Health. With a couple great presentations lined up, um, looking at family well-being, community-based programs to support family and social cohesion, and specific uh, and considerations for policymakers. And given the number of hats they both wear, this is like the only hour and 15 minutes, I think, that we can get both in the room till like 2019. So we're really excited to have both of them here today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to briefly introduce the Evidence-Based Health Policy Project. The goal of this project is to connect research and expertise at the university and elsewhere into the health policymaking process here at the Capitol and to support an evidence-informed approach to decision-making uh, through public briefings like this, regional conversations held across the state, uh, and training sessions for legislators and staff on specific resources for evidence. This project is driven by the idea uh, based on the Wisconsin idea that ongoing dialogue and the development of trust between policymakers uh, and academic researchers can enhance the work of both. We work to serve as a resource at the Capitol and a resource on campus uh, through nonpartisan events such as this one uh, and facilitating interaction mutual learning uh, where possible. This project is a unique partnership of the UW Madison's Population Health Institute where I work, uh, the La Follette School of Public Affairs also at UW Madison and the Wisconsin Legislative Council the nonpartisan legal staff for the legislature. I'd like to recognize Hillary Shagger from the LaFollette School as well as Steve McCarthy from the Ledge Council who are both here today. And thanks also to Stephanie Mar Mar Marberger, our project assistant who makes sure everything runs smoothly. I'd also like to recognize the Institute for Research on Poverty for their, or IRP, for their cooperation in planning and executing this, uh, this series. Their work in advancing the understanding and causes of poverty in the United States makes them a natural partner uh, in this. And we look forward to drawing on their uh, their expertise of, the fa of their faculty affiliates. So thanks to Dr. Berger, as well as Jennifer Noyes, who is no longer with IRP, uh, and Dave Chancellor, who is in attendance today and were, were huge helps as this project took shape. Uh, the EBHPP is made possible by the support of our funders, uh, which include the Wisconsin Partnership Program at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, the Community Academic Partnerships Corps at the uh, uh, Institute for Clinical and Translational Research at UW, also known as ICTRCAP, and the UW Madison Chancellor's Office. We thank them for their support in enabling us to hold programs like this that are free and open to the public and uh, supporting our work to connect research into the policymaking process. We develop these events with input from our legislative advisory board, a bipartisan group of legislators that includes uh, with a broad perspective on, on health issues. Uh, this membership includes Representative Jesse Rodriguez, who is with us today, as well as uh, Representative Joe Sanfilippo, Daniel Reamer, Joan Balwig, Deborah Colstein, and Paul Tittle and Senators Devin Lemahieu, Mark Miller, and Leah Buchmeyer. I see Senator Miller is here as well today. Uh, we truly appreciate their engagement, uh, as well as all the legislative staff who are in attendance today, uh, so thank you. This series grew out of discussions between our office and legislative staff regarding this framework uh, of population health, which is developed by colleagues of mine and refined over the years, uh, by colleagues of mine at the UW Population Health Institute. Uh, you can see how Health factors and policies and programs feed into the health outcomes of individuals and communities. And though the percentages assigned to each of these factors may be up for debate, uh, the model provides a really nice framework for thinking about how, uh, how a community's health is determined and what drives health. Obviously, clinical care and health behaviors play a large role, um, but also where we live, work, and play also drives, uh, drives what makes communities healthy. In this framework, these are called the social determinants of health and include education, employment, income, family and social support, community safety, air and water quality, and housing and transit. The goal of this series is to dive into each of these factors a little more deeply, uh, to take a look at what the landscape looks like in Wisconsin and provide some takeaways for policymakers. We're starting today with family and social support um, and look forward to the, today's presentations on how uh, family, uh, how that factor affects emotional well-being as well as physical health. Um, and how that will affect health of communities and individuals across the life course. Part of the equation that gets us to good health outcomes is uh, strong public policy, and the front lines of building that policy framework is the state legislature. 
So for that reason, I'm really excited to welcome Representative Jesse Rodriguez, who's the chair of the Assembly Committee on Family Law, uh, for some open remarks and her perspective on her committee's work uh, and the interaction of family and social support as she sees it uh, in, in her district. A graduate of Marquette University, Representative Rodriguez was elected to uh, represent the state's 21st Assembly District in 2013, uh, following work that included um, a time as outreach coordinator for Hispanics for School Choice. In addition to her role as chair of the Committee on uh, Family Law, she serves on the Assembly Education and Energy Committees, as well as on the Speaker's Task Force for Foster Care. She lives in Oak Creek with her husband Aaron and her son Noah, who just started second grade, I believe. Yeah. Um, so, Representative, thank you for your participation today and your engagement in this broader discussion. Please help me welcome Representative Jesse Rodriguez. Well, thank you, Sam. And uh, I want to thank all of you who have come today. It looks like it's a pretty full room, and I'm, I'm glad to see the, the amount of people that have showed up to this presentation. You know, when it comes to discussing families and social support, uh, it's an issue that certainly we hear and we discuss a lot about here in, in our Capitol building. When we talk about, you know, poverty, when we talk about homelessness, when we talk about um, the legal system, and one area that I want to talk about today uh, is foster care. So um, I, I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to, to be able to have just a little bit uh, of information on what we're doing on the foster care task force, but I also want to thank our speakers today and I look forward to hearing the research that you have, um, that you have you're going to provide uh, for us uh, that would help address some of the, the concerns that we're hearing here in the Capitol building. Um, this. Uh, this earlier, uh, this year, the speaker uh, boss, he assembled the speaker's task force on foster care, and I happen to be uh, one of the members of that task force. Um, it's an area that um, I think it's very important that we look at, seeing that we've been hearing that a lot of kids are uh, entering into the foster care at um, higher rates than we've seen in, in previous years. And so our goal for the committee, um, who is being chaired by Representative Pat Snyder from WASA and Representative Steve. Steve Doyle uh, from La Crosse is to find uh, find out what's going on throughout our, our state, uh, what areas that we need to um, focus on, uh, and and see if we can find solutions to help with foster with the foster care system. So um, we did six hearings throughout the state, and our goal was to um, uh, hear from different. Uh, 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 organizations and uh, foster parents um, and also uh, foster uh, kids, uh, now adults who were at one time in the foster system, and just uh, hear their perspective on what's uh, what we need to do and um, what we need to change. Uh, based on all the hearings, we've uh, kind of uh, settled on four areas that we're seeing that were being that were coming up as issues that we needed to address, and one of them was um, prevention and supporting families. So um, when we uh, were out, uh, we were uh, talking to a lot of the health services uh, departments. Um, a lot of organizations that are involved in providing support for parents. Uh, one, one, two counties that came up uh, that seemed to have a, a great program, uh, they were Marathon County and Kenosha County, and they talked about you know being able to identify uh, families who were in crisis, families that were not in the foster care system but maybe were, ha were really struggling and could potentially you know uh, find themselves in the, in the foster care system. So what they do is identify those families and they go and, and do more home visits with them, uh, provide, find out what it is that, um, you know, that, that the services that they may need, and try to uh, connect them to the services, thereby, you know, helping, to, helping them and hopefully preventing them um, having to, you know, go into the foster care system. The other uh, area that we saw that we needed to address uh, is support for foster kids. So we have a lot of kids who are aging out of the system. It's unfortunate that we, we have that happening in our state. Um, and also a lot of kids who are being moved from one school to another, um, interruptions in their, in their uh, education because you know, maybe, you know, they, they ended up at a foster home, mom is better, they go back home, but mom is really not as good as she needs to be, and they go back into the system again. And that, you know, that basically causes those children to move from one school district to another to another, and 
you know, their education is affected by that. You know, how can a kid potentially, you know, do well if they're moved from one school to another, not learning everything that they need? And as we know, some of the school districts have different requirements too. So we are looking to see if we can uh, find ways to solve that. The other concern for foster kids is that you know, there's uh, 84, they did a study, and 84% of foster kids say they want to go to college. Uh, only 20% of those that graduate high school end up going to college. And of those that do go to college, only 2 to 9% of those um, end, up, end up graduating college. I mean, that's pretty staggering. Um, and we had uh, some uh, uh, kids who were in the foster system who are now adults, you know, testify and say, you know, I didn't know that I, you know, I needed all these services. You know, we had uh, one, uh, Jamila Love, I think a lot of people know her. Um, she, she said, her testimony was very powerful in that she was, you know, she said, you know, the, the brochures that you see for college, you know, uh, campuses and everything, you see them all decked out. They have a comforter. They have, you know, my crave. They have a fridge. They have all these other things. And she says, I didn't know that I had to provide that, that I had to buy that. I thought it came all full, fully furnished. And it's just, you know, obviously they're, they're, they haven't had uh, people mentors or parents who can help them and guide them as to what is expected in college and what what kind of services they need in order to be there so you know we're looking at ways that maybe we could provide that sort of support for them um, uh, I, I believe it was UW Stout who has a program for foster kids and they're doing a great job there um, and provided some guidance to to kids who are in college and a lot of these kids don't you know don't end up um, going to you know uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving they end up spending it in their campuses, hopefully, you know, if, if the campus is open. So uh, look at how do we uh, support foster kids. The other area is support for foster parents. You know, the, the role of uh, being a foster parent uh, from the testimony that we heard from foster parents was that it's very difficult. They're seeing a lot of children who have mental health problems. Um, they have behavior problems. And they're trying to address it and, and be in communication with the schools to try to um, mitigate a lot of those problems that they're seeing at the school. So, you know, um, one of the things that they said is, you know, they, they would like to see uh, su support from um, the department to provide more services for them, to have a better communication with the school districts on, on the children that they foster. And the last item that I wanted to mention was county support. So uh, some of the counties um, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, they're, they're small, and sometimes they don't have foster homes or foster parents who can provide um, a home for a, a child. And so a lot of them are resorting to an adjoining county. Now, I, I know that ne no one, not, not myself, and I don't think anybody would love to see a child you know, who lives in one county being moved to another county. But unfortunately, if, if there aren't any parents, foster parents who can take care of them, they're going to have to go somewhere. And um, one of the things that uh, they uh, suggested uh, for county support was um, being able to license homes in other counties. But um, I mean, and we currently do this, but the, the licensing is child specific. So if a child needs a home and they find a home in another adjoining county, uh, they, the child uh, ends up, let's say the child ends up um, being reunited with their parent, um, then that child is moved from that home and to the parent. But if there's another child uh, who needs a home and that home is available, they can't send that child to that home because they need to be re-licensed again, even though they were already licensed to have a child previously. So that's a problem that uh, the counties have said, you know, is a concern to them. And it would help uh, the process for them just because we, they could easily put a child into a home that's available much, much more quickly than having to go through all the hoops of getting all the licensing. So these are just a few things that uh, we looked at uh, that we heard uh, from people who came to testify at our committee. Um, I would say stay tuned because this is a committee that um, is uh, proposing legislation uh, hopefully before the end of the year. So stay tuned to see what some of that legislation is and hopefully uh, we can get uh, some of your support on that. So with that, um, I will um, send it over back to, to Sam. Well, thanks very much, Representative Rodriguez.
couple nuts and bolts things before we throw it to our panel. Um, the folders you received today uh, have several documents inside, including today's agenda, biographies for each speaker, and a list of further resources on this topic, uh, as well as uh, one-pagers on EBHPP and the Population Health Institute. Um, and most importantly, you'll see a yellow two-sided ev evaluation sheet that should help you take a minute to, uh, to fill out. We really aim to be as responsive as possible to the needs uh, of our audience, uh, and we can't do that without uh, your feedback. And uh, in particular, since this is the first and what we hope will be an ongoing series, your responses will be especially useful as we build out uh, subsequent uh, sessions to this, so please fill those out. Um, for the social media savvy among you, feel free to tweet along at home on your chair with the hashtag EBHPP. And also, you'll see there are cameras in the room from Wisconsin Eye, as well as a team from UW Extension. So the video and materials will all be shared with everyone in the room uh, following the event. So I'll pass it off to uh, our first speaker, Lonnie Berger, uh, who's director of the Institute for Research on Poverty at UW Madison. He's also the Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor and PhD Program Chair at the School of uh, Social Work. His research focuses on what drives parental behaviors and child and family well-being. And he's engaged in studies in several research areas, including the determinants of child maltreatment, associations between socioeconomic factors and children's care, and the influence of public policies on child and family well-being. Thanks very much, Dr. Berger, for being here, and take it away. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am uh, really thrilled to see such a good turnout for um, what's a really important topic. I'm also um, thrilled that the approach to this and the approach to health in this is a very sort of general um, conceptualization of health that goes beyond just physical and mental health to really think about well-being of the population, well-being of individuals and families. Um, so I was asked to talk about the role of the family in the sort of uh, well-being and what it means for public policy. Um, I'm going to uh, make one quick plug based on Representative Rodriguez's comments. So I'm not going to talk about foster care today. Uh, my colleagues and I at IRP do a lot on the child welfare system, foster care system, so maybe we can come back and talk to you uh, again on those topics. But I really um, uh, want to commend you on this really important work that affects a lot of kids um, in, in serious ways. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is more generally um, what's been going on with um, American families and a little bit honing in somewhat on, on Wisconsin families, what it means for health and development across the life course, um, and how public policy is or isn't um, consistent with families' experiences um, in the, the, the modern um, era. Um, and I think the key word, that, the takeaway word, is going to be complexity or complex. And so what I mean by that is that both that, that families have grown increasing with high rates of non-marital births. I'll show you some data on that. We have high rates of parental cohabitation, parental breakup. Um, divorce rates are still high, although they've been declining in, in recent decades. Um, we have uh, lots of churning in families. And so we can think about two different things going on. So parental roles have changed over time in the last four or five decades in some way around you know, separating breadwinner and child-rearing roles. So more and more, both parents are expected to do both. Um, but if we look at family forms, what we see increasingly is instead of two-parent biological families or a single-parent family with a, a non-custodial, uh, non-present biological parent, we see married and cohabiting step-families, right? We see uh, families that include other adults. We see adult uh, uh, children moving in with parents, parents moving in with their children. We see uh, step-siblings, half-siblings, full-siblings. So lots of complexity. And this changes over time. So families aren't stable in a way. And so what this means is people are taking on multiple roles, both across time and at the same time. So you're at the same time a biological resident father or mother and a step parent, and maybe also a non biological or a, a non or a non resident parent to a kid who lives somewhere else. And I'm going to show you some data on this complexity. And so this becomes really important for thinking about you know when we say a parent and a child, what exactly do we mean? Um, it turns out that now most U.S. children won't spend their entire uh, childhood living with both of their biological parents. So the majority of kids will spend some time in a single parent household. Um, or a uh, household that includes an, a non-biological caregiver. Um, and kids are increasingly likely to transition in and out of multiple uh, households. 
Um, I'll show you data in a minute that about over 40%, about 43% of all kids are born to un unmarried parents. Um, if you look at parents under 30, it's over 50%. Most of that children, those children will experience family complexity and fluidity. So they'll cycle through multiple types of households and family structures, and most of them will uh, experience multi-partner fertility on behalf of one, of their, one or both of their parents. So their parents will have children with, with someone else. Um, and over a third of kids will live with a parent to, with whom they're not biologically related at some point. So the way we think about families um, has changed dramatically in the way families look. And so what this means is, so this increased diversity and fluidity in family forms means that kids are exposed to a much wider variety of parental figures and potential caregivers, right? Um, which could have benefits, right? If you have more people devoting time, devoting care, devoting money, it could be good. Um, at the same time, it makes family functioning much more complicated. You're negotiating relationships, you're negotiating time, you're negotiating money, you're negotiating care across households and in a way that changes. Um, second set of points. So this complexity and fluidity are uh, disproportionately likely among disadvantaged groups. So we can think of that as primarily among lower educated groups. Um, this also plays out uh, across other types of social and economic advantage. Um, and so the most disadvantaged individuals are most likely um, to experience non-marital births, to have father absence, to have multi-partner fertility um, and fam family complexity. And so this has some implications for intergenerational transmission of poverty and of inequality. Because what we're seeing is the kids who are born um, to, the, to, fa to families that lack social and economic resources um, are also most likely to experience family instability. And there's evidence that family instability is a, le a less uh, um, uh, conducive um, arrangements for, for child well-being. We also know that as parents repartner, so as either mothers or fathers find new partners, have additional children, um, what you see is non-custodial parents' uh, support for children falls off over time. Right? So and that is both uh, commitment to time and commitment of um, money and child support. The difference is smallest among formal child support because we have a formal child support enforcement system. Um, the differences are bigger among informal transfers of cash and informal um, time. So in turn, family complexity and fluidity are also associated with a variety of um, poorer outcomes. So they're associated with greater stress for parents and children, with lower parental investments, with greater poverty and income inequality, and poorer child outcomes. So what we're seeing is a selection into uh, kids that we already might expect to uh, struggle into family situations um, that are more and more difficult. Last sort of big picture point, and then I'll show you some data and things. So most of our public policies were designed in a much simpler family era. So they were desi designed with two parents with mutual biological children. The parents either lived together or split up and one of the parents isn't there. And the way we tend to conceptualize benefits in food assistance, in tax credits, in child support, in health care coverage, in income and welfare, in almost every domain is around that family situation. And so what we're really talking about is one kid with multiple parents, with, with uh, a set of parents, and parents don't have multiple kids, and there aren't complicated relationships. It gets much harder when kids are spending time in multiple households and with multiple uh, parental figures. So for example, uh, I'll give you two quick examples. So one, child support. Child support should be the easiest, right? Turns out, take uh, mother and father, both have two children, and consider whether they have only two children together or whether each of those two children is with a different partner, right? The mom has two children with two kids with the same partner. She receives less for the children in child support than if she had children with two different partners. The father pays less than he would have if he had children with two, diff with two different mothers. Second child, if it's with a different mother, would get less money than the first child, right? So this becomes very complicated, even in what should be the most simple of, of systems. Think about health care, right? Even if we had, uh, so even under a mandated health care system, who covers the child? The married stepfather uh, who lives with the child 
the non-married or the non-married biological father who doesn't live with the child. Think about this even more complicated in terms of family leave benefits, any kind of coverage if the parents aren't married, right? So this is becomes very complicated for thinking about how to transfer um, uh, uh, resources. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the next roughly 12 minutes uh, is quickly <laughs> tell you uh, how fluid and complex today's families are, what it means for what this complexity and fluidity means for family functioning, and a few considerations and implications for policy. So how complex and fluid are families? So between 1980 and now, more than a doubling in the proportion of children who are born outside of married, from marriage, from about 21% to 43%. Big takeaway, less of a difference in uh, single parent births that are not living with a cohabiting partner. Almost all of this difference has been a shift from married births to cohabiting births. Uh, cohabiting couples also break up very quickly compared to married couples. So these are, uh, essentially a representative sample of children born in large cities. The solid uh, uh, parts of the graph are children who did not experience a family structure change among their parents uh, by age nine. So what you see among all families, 50% of kids between birth and age nine experienced at least one family structure change. If we look at married families, kids whose parents were married at birth, 30% of them will have experienced the family structure change, so the parents divorce by age nine, right? And then this is one, two, and three or more changes. If we look at families that were cohabiting, 70% of them will have experienced their parents break up by age nine. Another uh, uh, you know, 20, 25% will have experienced their parents break up, a new partner, and then another 20% or 25% will have experienced the breakup of that partner as well by age nine. The other thing to note is cohabiting parent families and single parent families look very similar. Cohabiting parents don't look like married parents. These are Wisconsin kids. So these are all Wisconsin kids born to uh, a non-married mothers, and it's the mother's first birth. And so these are looking at these kids from birth to age 10. So at birth, 15% of them, their dads already had a child with another partner. Uh, Seven, you know, the mother in, in all these cases hasn't had. By the time we get to age 10, 70% of the kids have siblings. Um, for only 40%, do they only have full siblings or being an only child? So 60% have half siblings on their mother's side, father's side, or both. So what we're seeing is lots of fluid. So these are a nationally representative sample of young adults, um, and we're looking at them at roughly 1979, 1997. And so this is the probability that by age 30, you're at the, at simultaneously have two parental roles. So you're both, this is men, a resident parent and a non-resident parent. You're both a biological parent and a step parent. And what we've seen in this 20 year period is a doubling. So by, uh, by 1997, 16% of 30 year olds are simultaneously in two fathering roles. Um, if I showed you this for women, it's doubled as well, but it's more like 4 and 8%, and that's because mo mothers are, are much more likely to be resident and not to have non-resident kids. Um, if I show you these trends by education and race, here's the big takeaway. Right? This has in increased, this, this complexity, um, these multiple roles have increased for every group except those with a bachelor's degree or more, right? and they've increased um, uh, considerably for all those groups. So what does this mean for kids? Um, and I kind of started with this. So these differences in parental investments in family functioning, so even after accounting for differences in education at birth, income at birth, um, and a host of other characteristics are associated with a wide range of poor outcomes on average, not for every kid, but on average for children. So from family stress and conflict, to economic investments, to test scores, to social emotional functioning, um, to the likelihood of participating in the labor market as adults, to the likelihood of an unintended pregnancy and non-marital birth. So some takeaways for public policy. So first, policy really needs to now balance a much wider range of factors um, than it traditionally does. And what we need to think about is these multiple actors, these multiple roles within the same actors, 
and multiple relationships both within and across family units, right? So we need to think about biological, marital, and co-residential roles. Which do we privilege at which points in time and in which policies, right? We then need to think about the needs, capabilities, and well-being of mothers, fathers, and children, particularly in this context of multi-partner fertility where parents have children with multiple partners and across households. And to make it even more complicated, right, this changes over time. So when you apply for food stamps, you may have one food unit, and six months later, that food unit, when you go to recertify, may have changed. And it may have changed in the first month, the third month, the fifth month, right? Public policy also has a range of economic and behavioral goals. And we really need to think about, across all of these, adequacy, affordability, and equity in both pri private and public transfer. So how do we do child support? How do we do uh, food support? How do we do health care? Um, taking each of these things into account. I'm going to highlight two main areas of policy in about three minutes. Uh, the first being, how do we prevent family complexity? So delaying childbirth provides extensive returns in terms of education, in terms of lifetime income, in terms of outcomes for parents and for adults. The vast majority of non-marital births, almost 75% of them to women under 30 are unintended. I showed you the vast majority of these parents will break up relatively early in their children's life. So reducing unplanned pregnancy has massive implications for reducing poverty, reducing abortion, reducing, uh, increasing time between births, increasing the birth outcomes, the prenatal care and care after kids. Um, and reducing expen government expenditure. So huge implications. Essentially, we've tried three things to date. So we've done abstinence education. Um, the evidence has been universally disappointing. Um, basically, you know, all of the studies show that we haven't figured out how to make it work. We've tried marriage promotion. The evidence has been nearly university dis universally discouraging. That's not to say, so look, the best path is get an education, get a job, find a relationship, get married, have a child, right? That's not to say that we shouldn't keep trying. We haven't yet designed programs that work. Um, the third thing that we've tried is making long-acting reversible contraceptives uh, widely and easily available to women who come to family planning services seeking contraception. Um, the evidence is relatively early. The evidence is quite promising, so we need some more rigorous studies, but st evidence from Denver, from St. Louis is quite promising. Um, I want to make, I'll make two big points here and then I'll talk uh, uh, about tr um, serving families. So big points is that families should both address the reality of family complexity and it's unrealistic to focus on current couples and their joint children. We have to think about their larger family context um, and promote healthy relationships among that wider set of actors. Um, and then secondly, for non-custodial parents, so policy should really recognize that child support, uh, employment, and father involvement really go hand in hand, right? And these are really complements and not substitutes. Um, so one thing that I would argue is that we should think about providing parallel packages of supports, benefits, and tax credits uh, that are available to custodial parents, to non-custodial parents. So this would include, so most non-custodial parents in policy are approached as non-parents, right? So they're adults without dependents because their dependents don't live with them. And so we could think about work supports and benefits that give partial credit for non-resident children conditional on paying child support. And we could withhold child support from tax credits from other types of benefits, right? Um, I think it is crucial that we do have a strong child support enforcement system. But we should also recognize that what we often do for non-custodial, for custodial parents is help them to connect to employment and help them to increase their wages in employment. We have a W-2 system that does that. We don't have a parallel uh, um, pro set of programs for non-custodial parents. And so that we should think about if we expect non-custodial parents to pay child support, which we should do, how can we promote that through the tax system and through work supports? Um, and then the criminal justice system is just, lo just looms hugely over this entire population. Um, and it's really important to think about these reforms in the context of uh, particularly men with criminal justice histories. 
Um, so thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, address more details in the Q&A.